Hey, today I want to really break down a little bit about the technical piece of it that everybody's seen today. And now I'm going to try to transition into how do we honestly use that? And so I'm from St. Louis. I got a private pitching consultant where, or where I work with mostly college and pro guys. And we work on not just the mindset piece of it, but honestly, what it takes to play at the next level, what it takes to be a great college pitcher, a great pro pitcher. And, and then the bulk of what I do is really confidential consulting. And, and as a former minor league player, got drafted out of high school and it was a culture shock for me. I came from a small town in Missouri. And as I really started to grow up and, and look at the odds and the chances of playing college baseball or even pro baseball, it was a different conversation back then in the 80s than it is today. And so the opportunity today for you guys to really understand how the body works, how to train, nutrition, all those things that have put you miles ahead of where we were probably 30 years ago, has changed the game. And so now it's time that we really have a conversation about how do we blend those two together. And so today that's really what I want to talk about. And so there's three keys that I really focus on with my college and pro clients that is, is the key to having a lot of success at the next level. And then how do we honestly, personally take that uh, training, take all the stuff that we've done and translate it into what we do on the mound and how it honestly works in a real game. So the first thing I want to talk about is physical capability, and good health. That's the obvious thing here. Because as you see all of the tools that have been presented today and all of the technology that's been presented today, it does a couple of things for most players and parents. It is either overwhelming or it's something that, you know what, it's not the way we grew up. It's not the tech. It's not the way uh, coaches taught us when we played. And so it brings a lot of confusion into the conversation. And so what happens is when we see that part of it start to elevate to the, to the higher levels, when we get into high school, get into college, and now you really start reaching your physical capability, which is what we usually try to develop pitches off of, is max velocity. And Brent will talk about that a little bit later today. As we tie this together is that when we try to go into individual pitcher development, it's really shaped around these three core things, physical capability, good health, and then individual pitch mastery, which is really about how you control the pitches in the strike zone and how do we effectively, as uh, the brother talked about earlier, how do we tunnel pitches? How do we sit here and show that hitter the first 20 feet, the same arm angle, the same arm path, and, and honestly move pitches in and out of the strike zone? And then the third piece we're going to talk about is strategic game planning and execution. And so as we walk through this, there's a couple things that I want you guys to look at. I want you to look at, honestly, the way that you thought the game was played and, and what you see while you're playing. And then, honestly, what the analytics, what all the technology shows us. And then hopefully, if I get through this right, I'm going to explain to you a, a practice schedule, a plan, a way to use this that, honestly, that you can take and grasp and understand and institute into practice that will translate into success in a real game. So again, my name is Daryl Polker. I was drafted out of high school in 86. I pitched four years in the minor leagues with the Phillies. I run a private uh, pitching consultant business where most of my clients are, are elite college and pro guys, where we really focus on the strategic part of it. We focus on how do we develop our individual pitches and really super personalize that to where they can effectively pitch against the best hitters in the world. And so I, I got a business called Start Pitching. Uh, I created a strategic pitching program, which is what we're going to talk about mostly today. But really, this is about syncing together the technology, the data. How do we analyze it? What great coaches like you've seen today, how they use that? And then how do we get to the other side of that? How does that honestly translate into success on the field? And so the, the goal for today is to help you find a way to identify the core pitching problems that we see. See, that's the stuff that technology and data will give us. It will show us the things that the eye can't see. It will show us the things that the conventional wisdom and coaching would tell us that here is the obvious problem, here's the quick fix, and rarely in today's world with high-speed cameras and all the technology we have today, we've come to find out that a lot of the coaching, a lot of the techniques, a lot of the stuff that was taught when I played just ain't true. 
that high speed video shows us that we don't go and hesitate before we go home plate, that it's a, it's a powerful movement between our feet that creates velocity. And so today I wanna to make sure that when we start looking at problems, that you know the difference between a symptom, which is what we feel, and then what is the, the core root problem? Because when we see data and analytics, that is the whole goal of it. And then on the back side of it, we want to make sure that when we fix that problem, when you come and train with, with good coaches and they understand how that data and how that works, that it honestly translates to success on the field. And then the third thing, I want, I want you to find the right, the right options that will help you become a next level pitcher. Because ultimately, that's the kind of clients I work with. Everybody that comes through that I do my assessments with is truly based on what I call the seven core things of what it takes to pitch in the big leagues. And one is intellectual interest, man. How, how curious are you about the game of baseball, what it's going to take to, to get to the next level? And they were talking about it in some earlier talks today, how we have to focus on what we really uh, are dialed into, what is our goals? What is our plan? What do you guys want to personally do? And is this something that you're willing to make sacrifices for to get to that next level? The second piece is, is mentally focused. I think too often that we, we generalize in the baseball world. We, we use a lot of cliches. And unfortunately, them cliches, as much as they might be true on the surface, they don't create clarity. So a lot of times we end up practicing the wrong things and we keep working harder and harder and harder on the wrong things. And honestly, we get worse. And so what technology does today with the data that we're using today, it gives us the ability to make those adjustments quicker. And so if you guys really will slow down and, and honestly listen to the coaches, take this data and understand how it translates into how we practice, then I think you guys will see that the improvements that you make it's honestly what it's going to take for you guys to get to the next level. So <clears throat> the first thing I really want to ask you now is here's the big question I ask every client I get. And so what is the biggest pitching problem or struggle you have right now? Just call them out. What, what do you guys think is the biggest struggle you have with pitching? And then I'll start showing you what, what the answers I get. And these are from some of the best pitchers in the world. Right here, bad mechanics, clean up mechanics. You know what, every time we talk about we don't throw a pitch for a strike, we want to go back and default and blame it on the physical aspect of the game. It's just what we were trained to do, it's what we've done. Every time that, you know what, we walk a hitter, the coach wants to change us. And I think at the highest levels, when we start talking about guys that throw 95 miles an hour consistently, how they move matters. Any kind of slight movement pattern change that they have is going to make a huge adjustment in how the ball ends up moving. And so what we do a lot of times is we don't think about the mental side, the mental effects of what happens when we go out here and we take this data and we just make changes flippantly and what the effect is on your kid. And so when we start looking through that as, from a coach's perspective, really how we tie this all together and what it really means is there's a couple of things that happen. When we start struggling and we're not having success, we think the symptom is the problem. And so what happens is if, an example I use with a lot of guys is if you got a headache, then the headache is a symptom. There's something that caused the headache. And how we dig down through those core levels to find out what caused the headache is the fix. So when you go see somebody that's gonna do uh, an analytic breakdown of your biomechanics, there's two things that we're trying to do. We're trying to figure out if there's something in that movement pattern that's causing the problem. And if it is, then it's not the bad mechanics that is the true problem. It's just a symptom of what we're not doing. And so no different than if we had a headache. There could be a hundred different reasons why you have a headache. And you might take a couple of aspirin to get rid of the headache. But the truth of it is, until we understand what really caused the headache, then we've not solved that problem. And so that's the advantage that we have today when we have the different tools, the different analytics, and then we can sit down and honestly do this on an individual basis. The second question, or the second answer I get a lot of times is, lack of command can't throw strikes. Again, it's a symptom. 
there's something else going on. It's either something that we're doing biomechanically or it's something that when we step on the rubber and we get the sign from the catcher that we have some sort of hesitation. There's some, some sort of uh, disconnection on whether we confidently think that is a pitch that we can throw right then at that time. And so what happens is that the brain will slow the body down. Whenever we have doubt, most pro pitchers that I work with don't have a command problem. They have an indecision problem. When they stand on the rubber and that catcher puts a sign down, they got to decide right then what is the absolute best pitch they could throw in that situation and count. And so what happens a lot of times is when that pitch got hit the last time or they missed the last time, they just don't trust that pitch like they used to. And people don't really want to take into account the psychological effect, the mindset, the piece of, of the environment and how that affects how you think while you're playing. And so the conversation that we have a lot of times is really a deconstructive conversation. It's a matter of what are we doing? Why are we doing it? And then, you know what, honestly, how do we use it? So as we start working through this today, I want you guys to see a couple of things that we either identify symptoms and we try to put a bandaid on it, or we identify symptoms and we truly try to dig down a couple of layers and figure out what is the core problem. And that's the cool thing about today. That's the cool thing about the technology today, because a lot of coaching cliches would have us make adjustments based on what just the, the history of how we were all taught to play. And now with the data, with all the information we have, it really can change the game. A lack of velocity, not strong enough, sore arms, out of shape, mentally weak, which is my favorite, mentally weak. What does mentally weak mean, honestly? See, that drives me nuts because in baseball, we got a tendency to generalize everything. It's either physical or mental. And the truth of it is, it's, it's not either one a lot of times. A lot of times, it's an intellectual understanding. It's something that I don't grasp yet, or I'm not physically capable of doing it yet. So our expectations change the performance level. The expectations change the way we practice. And as parents and as coaches and dealing with young athletes, whether you're 15 or whether you're 25 in double A trying to get to the big leagues, I'm gonna tell you something. The psychological effect is the same. The conversations that I have with a lot of 15, 16 year olds, you'd be amazed. I have that same conversation with guys that just got $2 million signing bonuses. Because the reality of this game is, is that, you know what? Baseball is baseball. We can use all this technology and data, and it can really enlighten us to an opportunity of what it takes to play at the next level. And we can have that intellectual interest, but we don't have a working knowledge. We honestly don't know how to use it. So a lot of my business is about pitch development. It's honestly about how do we master our pitches? How do we take one individual pitcher and we, and we help them take the biomechanical piece of it the strength and conditioning piece of it, the nutrition piece of it, and honestly take one pitcher and teach them how to master their pitches. And see, that's the, that's the beautiful thing about baseball. Baseball is a paradox sport, I call it. It's an individual team sport. There's nine individual positions, and each one of them has a job that they have to do on their own. And you know what? You're out there by yourself, especially pitching. You're the center of attention. You're right in the middle of the field. And if you can't handle that pressure alone, then... That is one of the biggest issues that we have with a lot of young players. And parents, you guys push them out there, coaches push them out there, they got a good arm and they, they want them to pitch. And they don't understand the psychological effect of what it means to go out there and truly be the center of attention. And so a lot of these conversations, it's, it is amazing to me because when I dig deeper with my pro guys, I have a couple of first questions that I ask. And, and really, here's the heart and soul of it. What is the best experience you ever had playing baseball? And usually, you know what they do, man? They jump out of their seat. They can't wait to tell you about when they won a state championship, how it felt with their teammates, all the things that they did, what it took to get to that point. And then I'll ask them, what was your worst experience in baseball? And most of the time it was in Little League or in 12 to 13 or 14 year olds. And you know what happens is that there was something that they needed to know, they needed to learn, they didn't understand, and a coach made them feel stupid. And what ends up happening with that is that we take that and we own that for the rest of our baseball career. I don't care how good of an athlete they are. I don't care if they went in the first round or if they went in the 20th round. 
that you know what they'll wear that negativity with them for the rest of their career until they believe that either they've overcome that or until they believe that you know what that it just ain't true or guess what they end up wearing that one day struggling in the minor leagues and what ends up happening i get calls all the time that says you know what i wish i could just pitch like i did when i was in high school and it's hard to believe some of these guys are the best players in the world and you, and, you, and you see the struggles they go through. You see the pain they go through. And see, a lot of times we don't have this conversation. This ain't the sexy baseball talk. This ain't the thing where we sit here and, and it makes everybody feel good. But this is the reality of the conversations I have with guys that want to play at the next level. Because this is the conversation that they don't get to have with very many coaches. And Jim and some of these guys that played at elite level can tell you, the higher you get, the more you need one person that will tell you the truth. You might not like it, you might not like them, but you need one person to tell you the truth. And so for the next few minutes, that's what I want to, I want to do with you guys. I want to share with you the truth about how this game is beautiful, it's awesome, you love it, it's hard, it drives you crazy. You play so often that, you know what, the odds of being successful is great, but the truth of it is the numbers itself tell you that seven out of ten times you're going to get out. The numbers are going to tell you that, you know what, the umpire and the hitter and all your teammates have a lot more control on the outcome of the game than you do as a pitcher. And so what I really try to do with these pitchers is get them dialed into what they can control. And so the last four or five things I want you to understand about what we evaluate, intellectual interest, mentally focused on things they can control. And then do you practice to improve till mastery? So we don't practice just to get through it. We don't practice just to go through the motions. We practice so we can continue to improve until we master it, until we get to where we're absolutely understand when I stand on that rubber and that catcher puts the sign down, I know by velocity and movement to the location specifically where that ball is going to go. See, once we have physical capability and we have individual pitch mastery, then guess what? Now we can have a real conversation about what it takes to be a strategic pitcher see that's what it takes to pitch at the next level the game changes the game evolves technology has given us the ability to learn to read and study hitters and when i take pictures super deep in this that's what we talk about the cues and clues of the pattern habits and tendencies of hitters and so when you've got your pitches mastered now it's just chess now when i'm standing on the rubber i'm not worried about the outcome i'm not worried about whether i'm physically capable of throwing this pitch right now i'm not worried about if i can execute that pitch by velocity and movement to this location the only thing i'm worried about right now is what are you thinking what do i know about you what is your patterns habits and tendencies and can i exploit them with this next pitch see that's how intense baseball is that's why a lot of times these guys are more emotionally drained after the game than they are physically because if you're doing it right and you're really dialed in and focused on what it takes to be successful at the next level, then guess what? It's really about chess then. But we can only get there if we have that physical capability and good health, if we have our pitches individually mastered where we understand it. And then we can go out and really have what I, I consider the funnest part of the game is strategic game planning sitting down with them and saying, hey, man, here's what you're capable of doing. Here's who we're playing next week. Here's their lineup. Here's the patterns, habits, and tendencies. What do they do first pitch? What do they do 0-1? What do they do 1-0? See, once we start studying the game that way, now all of a sudden it becomes a little more intellectually interesting. Now all of a sudden the game ain't so, it ain't so boring. The fourth thing that I assess these people on and all my clients on and everything that comes is really about resilient adjustments. See, I use the acronym IMPRESS. It's intellectually interested, mentally focused. You know what? Practice to improve until mastery. Resilient adjustments. Nobody ever wants to talk about resilience. Resilience is probably the biggest key to being an effective baseball player. Because, again, you can go over 3 and you have to come back the next day and play. The, the guys in pro ball and the guys in big leagues will tell you that, that the, the grind of coming back the next day or having to come back out and make that next start after you suck the last two starts, that the emotional grind on you is worse than the physical grind on you. Because you know that you can throw your pitches. You know that you trust the things that you believe in, but you're not getting the results that happens. And so what happens is how resilient you are and how you make those adjustments in that high-pressure environment 
makes a huge difference on how long you survive at that level in the game. And so resilient adjustments, how well does your kid bounce back after he goes over three? How well does your kid bounce back after they get taken out in the first inning after they walk four hitters? Do they show up at practice the next day trying to improve? Or do they show up at practice the next day ready to quit? See, I had that conversation with some of the best players in the world, man, and it's tough. It's tough because the pressure of trying to get to the big leagues is unbelievable. It's like nothing you've ever seen. And, and you know what? The guys that make it, man, you got to tip your hat to them because it took more than physical talent. It took a desire. It took resiliency. It took persistence. It took more than what the average person is willing to pay to get there. And so as we start walking through these things, man, you got to be emotionally tough. You got to be a strategic thinker, a strategic game planner. You got to be willing to put the time in studying film. I try to I try to compare a lot of it to NFL quarterbacks. The best NFL quarterbacks, they're physically capable. They have talent and ability. But you know what they do better than anybody else? They study game film. And then when they break the huddle and they walk up to the line of scrimmage, they're scanning the defense. They're looking for cues and clues of what that defense is going to do so they know what to audible into or whether they stay with that play. See, pitchers got to be the same way. We got to be able to see the clues and cues of hitters. We got to see the patterns, habits, tendencies of, of hitters. And then we got to be able to execute strategically our pitches. See, that's the art of pitching. That's the fine line between what a guy that could throw 95 and a guy that could pitch at 95. See, that's the difference between a thrower and a pitcher. That's the difference between the guy that gets up every day and focuses on staying strong, taking care of his nutrition, making sure he's resting, making sure he's getting rid of all the junk out of his life, all the distractions out of his life, and is completely focused on doing exactly what he needs to do to pitch in the big leagues. And so the last one is situational count awareness. And if I was a scout, this is the only thing I would look for. This is a performance-based thing. But you know what? Situational count awareness tells us a couple things. One, it tells us if you prepared. And two, it tells us whether you can handle the pressure of a real game. See, situational count awareness means that when I'm in a real game under extreme pressure, that you know what, I can play in that situation and count. I'm going to pick the absolute best pitch to throw in that situation and count. And so with a lot of my pro clients, I do post-game evaluations. They'll pitch, we talk the next day, and, and the only two things that I really care about, honestly, with them, is how they pitch in negative counts, how they pitch 1-0, 2-0, 3-1, how they pitch with runners in scoring position. Because at the end of the day, that's the most stressful situation a pitcher will ever be in a baseball game. And how they execute their pitches in that environment will tell me more about them, their strategic preparation, their mental toughness, their emotional toughness, and their ability to handle the pressure to play in any environment. See, that's what pro teams really want if they were telling you the truth. They want strategic pitchers that can get hitters out. That's it. Now, all the other stuff that we're doing today is unbelievable. We're keeping pitchers healthier now than they ever been. But even though they're throwing harder than we did, I think Mike touched on it earlier today. The average fastball when I got drafted was like 85, 86 miles an hour. I was throwing that in high school at 5'11", 150 pounds. Now these kids today, man, they come out of high school. I had a guy we went and looked at a few years ago was throwing 100 miles an hour in high school. Unbelievable. And so when you see that kind of physical talent, you think, how can a 17-year-old kid, how can their body maintain that stress and do what it does? The kid had a good work ethic. The kid had a pretty good workout program. But what he's realizing now, as you start getting into the pro level and you're playing 150 games a year, that that stress on your body is not just mental and emotional. It does become physical as we start getting to that piece of it. And so as we finish, I want you guys to see a couple of things. There's a difference between symptoms and problems. And then how do we use data to change the way that we train players? How do we use data to, to develop pitches? And how do we use data to create strategies that any one of you guys could use in a real game? So the difference is, is that symptoms describe an unidentified problem. That's what all this technology will do for you. We can film your mechanics. We can film everything you do. And we can see everything in super slow mode today, what we couldn't see 30 years ago. So if we see an inefficiency in that backside, or we see you loading on your quad, or we see you getting out early on shoulder rotation, we can do something, use the VLO Pro. You can use a lot of tools then that will go back and identify that specific problem. But, but the thing that I want you guys to see is that 
the bad mechanics, the low velocity, those are symptoms of not having that backside strength. They're a symptom of what it takes. And so when we use this data right, when we use this technology right, then, then you know what, it lets us take these issues that are exposed and honestly create specific training programs just to fix that. See, that's the difference in today's game and then what it was 30 years ago. And we're seeing all that stuff happen. Or a lot of times we see this in coaching today, it reveals a personal bias about what we do, how we teach, how we coach. And all of us coaches that have done this very long will fight this because we get in patterns, habits, and tendencies as coaches. We like certain kind of players. We only want to draft or recruit or, or have certain type of players on our teams. And we get caught up in them same bias. And then what ends up happening, man, is we lose out on a lot of great players. There's players in here right now that don't think they'll have a chance to play in college because of the way they look in the mirror today. But three years from now, you'd be surprised if you made that, if you made that sacrifice. And if you did the things that you needed to do and you bought into what you needed to do right now, you'd be amazed at how many people in this room want to play in college and then be that late bloomer that turns into a pro prospect. But it starts with where you're at right now. Well, how are you identifying the problems and are we mislabeling those symptoms as the problem? So now we're just trying to fix the headache and we're not fixing the underlying problem. Does that make sense? Do we see that a lot of times in the game today? We, we sit here and we throw a pitch high and we overreact and then we try to change our whole pitching mechanics to throw the next pitch low instead of just changing the release point, which was honestly the problem to begin with. See, we even have that at the pro level, man. We see a lot of those adjustments that we need to make that we overcompensate because of the way we were taught when we were young. That's the awesome part about blending the technology that we have today with good coaching and with kids that are committed and dedicated. But again, as we know, the symptom is really the problem. So what is the fix? This is the question I get all the time. A lot of pro scouts ask this, coaches ask this, because it becomes about a mindset then. It really becomes about how committed you are to the game. What are you looking for out of the game? And then what are you going to get back to the game? And so the fix is really about don't stop at treating the symptom. When we see the symptom and we know that we're having a, a velocity issue, then go ahead and ask those two or three deeper questions that we're going to nail down in a minute. Avoid conventional baseball wisdom's obvious quick fix. This is probably the biggest crutch of us old school guys that when we had a kid struggling, we wanted to go out there and give them a quick fix. We wanted to go wave our magic wand over them like there was something that we were gonna magically say to them that was gonna change the pressure and stress of what they just did. A lot of times they walk the last two batters. A lot of times they throw eight or nine or 10 straight balls in a row. And truthfully, we don't know what to go out and tell them. So we just go out there and tell them something. And I'm gonna tell you something, not only does that affect them psychologically and it don't work ever, is that when we come back at the end of the game and we need to sit down and have that post game talk, we need to have that conversation the next day of practice, we lose kids throughout the game. That's why we see kids at 13 and 14 and 15 that were really good pitchers at, for their age at that, not playing when they're 17 and 18. Because not only has the expectations changed, the problems change. The things that they need to be corrected, the things that needs to be fixed, it takes sacrifice. A lot of times it's getting in the weight room. A lot of times it's going and finding a coach that can break down the biomechanic issues that they have and help them learn how to stay back and pitch healthily the way that they need to do it. And so when we do that, we see kids stay healthy and have success. When kids don't buy into that piece of it, it's really getting harder to play at the next level. And so when we see that, as Coach Sean talked about earlier when he was talking about recruiting, that when he goes and recruits kids, and it's the truth, whether you like it or not, the first thing they want to see is velocity. They want to see how hard you can throw. And it's not just about the velocity, it's about they know what it takes, what kind of power it takes to create that velocity. And so when we're looking at developing next level players for real, the sacrifice that it takes is something that, you know what, only you guys can decide. We can guide you and help you through it, but we can't do nothing but ask better and deeper questions. And so these are the kind of conversations that we have a lot of times with players, man. And it takes about four or five conversations before kids will open up and parents will open up because this is a conversation we're having today that most of the time you won't have with baseball coaches. That's why a lot of my consulting business is confidential and one-on-one. -on -one. I have conversations with some of the best players in the world from Major League All-Stars down to first-round draft picks 
And and what's honest, the the coolest thing about it is when they trust you, guess what? They kind of let that shell down and have a real conversation with you. And what's amazing about that, I have the same conversation with them that I have with 15 year olds. See, it don't change. Just because you got talent in the building and you have the and and you're under in the biggest spotlight in the world in the major leagues doesn't change the mindset of why they really want to play the game to begin with. And so when we have those debates, we have those questions, we have those, the ability to have an honest conversation with somebody you trust, having a coach in here that you can have that conversation with is priceless. And as parents, if you see your kids struggling, go grab a coach and have that conversation. Because every day you wait means one more opportunity that they're going to walk away from the game. And a lot of times these kids really love the game. They just don't understand what the next fix is. The problem is they think it's mechanics or they think it's velocity or they think it's a lack of strength. And the truth of it is it's the program that they're doing is the problem. You know what? They're trying to find a quick fix with these magic, magic velocity tools out there. And there ain't no quick fix to throwing hard. The only way you can throw hard is if you work your butt off, get in the gym, do the thing, do the strength and conditioning piece of it. And then you know what? Find you a coach that can help you now sync all that together. And the truth is pitching's hard. Throwing hard is hard. And when we get to that point of what, what people want to do and they raise their hand that I want to be the next level guy, then the first question comes. And I know Brent does it all the time, man, because I tell him his, his program, I love sending guys to his program because I know if they do it, they're committed because it is not easy. It's not, it's not complicated. It just, it takes sacrifice. It takes somebody committed to want to get better at the next level. And so when we ask those better questions, we ask those deeper questions, you know what we get? We get better answers to the problems that we have. So there's two ways that technology is used today, really in, in baseball. It's used diagnostically, where we can sit here and try to assess problems, try to prevent things from happening. And then with what I do with guys in pitch development and strategy, game day strategy development, is I want to use that same velocity to teach them how to read and study hitters. I want to teach them those same kind of, uh, use that same technology so we can start looking at the patterns, habits, and tendencies that we have that hitters are reading from us. See, now with everything being on video, everything being on ESPN, everything being, they can go in the clubhouse and they can loop the last 10 pitches you throw and big league hitters will go in there and watch it and they'll see everything you do. I tell a lot of young pitchers that when you get up there, a good hitter will set you up in the first inning. They'll take that strikeout looking just so you think that you got them figured out. And then the next at bat, man, they take that same pitch and drive it over the right field wall for a home run. And they giggle as they run around the bases. Because they understand that, you know what, they haven't figured out the cues and clues or the patterns, habits, and tendencies of you yet. But by getting to watch two or three pitches, four pitches, and then getting to build this false confidence up because of what they were able to do in the first inning, they're going to make you pay for it in the third, fourth, the fifth inning. See, that's the deeper psychology of baseball. That's the psychology of the best players in the world. And that's the difference between having a strategy and then just going out there and mindlessly playing the game. And so what's cool about this is though 15 and 16 and 17 year old kids are changing the game. See, they're buying into this technology sooner than we are. The problem is, is a lot of us coaches that we're scared of it. We're intimidated by it. We don't want to go take that information and be able to learn and study this stuff ourselves and then be able to go back and really help this kid that's curious, this kid that wants to get better. And so it's on a lot of us coaches to buy into some of this technology. It's not that the technology is mag the magic wand of making great pictures, but you know what it does? It gives us a huge advantage. And when we're sitting down with a kid that really wants to play, that that, that curiosity is what's going to drive 99% of their success down the road. And it's also what's going to drive their ability to have that resilient adjustments that they need to make and have that resiliency. And so let's talk about what smart baseball coaches are doing with this data. It gives us the ability to identify the symptoms so we can ask better questions. We don't want to treat the symptom until we understand what the underlying cause is. And so a lot of times when we go buy tools, and we go buy a lot of these velocity tools and we don't know how to use them, we get a lot of kids hurt. And it's not that there's something wrong with the tool, it's not knowing how to use the tool. I tell people all the time, that you can be a carpenter and you can use, you can use a nail gun or you can use a claw hammer. The nail gun will help you get the job done faster, but if you don't know how to use that nail gun, man, you can get hurt. 
And it's no different with pitching. You can do a lot of these things. You can go out and buy all these velocity tools, all these velocity programs in the world. But if you don't understand what it takes to create power between your feet and what it takes to throw the ball hard, just grabbing something and throwing it as hard as you can against the wall a hundred times a day, it might improve a little bit of your external rotation. But I promise you one thing, it's not going to make you a better pitcher. And the risk of you getting hurt is going way up through the roof. And so when we put a tool in the hands of somebody that don't know how to use it, it's not the tool's fault that, the, that you get hurt. And so when we have these conversations about what it takes to keep these kids healthy and what it takes to keep next level pitchers healthy, then we got to look at the totality of all of this. And so as we walk through this, data and technology gives us the ability to identify symptoms so we can ask better questions. It gives us the ability to identify the cues and clues to what the real problem is. See, now we can fix it. Now when you go to a coach that can use this technology, it understands what it is. It understands how your kid's unique movement patterns is and the different positions they're getting in that's going to cause the injuries. Now we can fix them before they become surgeries. See, that's the difference. Once we start feeling a pain and we got to really identify whether it's an injury or whether it's going to be a surgery. See, that's real parents. That's real coaches. We got to take that piece into into consideration we're talking about what we're doing how we're training these guys and then ultimately how it turns out and and we can't sit here and use you guys as guinea pigs and i know people get frustrated when we have these conversations because there's so many unique tools out there there's so many things that we can use to help get better but if you don't understand how to use those tools and you don't understand what you're doing then man the risk of injury goes through the roof and so find somebody before you just go buy something, before you go try something, especially as you're getting older and you're coming out of puberty and you really got some strength and you can do some stuff and you can do some real damage in one or two times of using that, find out what it is, get deeper into what it is and find that solution. And then the third piece is they just give us the ability to identify patterns, habits, and tendencies of what it takes to be a strategic pitcher, what it takes to be that next level pitcher. How do we have a conversation with well, how do we take data? How do we take all this information we have and turn it into a real practice plan? And so here's the trap though, that rarely does data give us the answer to that problem. And see, that's the awesome thing for coaches out there that we have the ability to, to make the difference. There's always gonna be a need for great coaches. There's always gonna be a need for a coach that wants to take this game to the next level. There's a lot of great college coaches that are buying into this technology, buying into the data, understanding that the human side of pitching don't change. The emotional side of pitching don't change. It's still about the kid. It's still about the player. But at the end of the day, if we can take this data, this technology and keep them healthier and use it to keep a game safer, then it changes the outcomes of not only the game, but it changes the outcomes of these kids' careers. And ultimately at the pro level, that's what they care about, is how do we stay physically capable and healthy? How do we individually master our pitches? And then how do we strategically use those in real game? And so options to overcome those obstacles, because the truth is, is that when we start looking at the, the symptoms and then we start identifying the problem, the reality of it is there's two things that happen. We either go to a coach that helps us find the options to getting around that and getting over that hump, how to fix bad mechanics, how to fix low velocity, how to fix a lack of command. And or we're going to sit here and struggle until we finally quit. And so how do we close that gap between bad mechanics and good mechanics is go have a biomechanical assessment done from a quality coach that understands what they're talking about, that can sit down and explain to you in, in real terms, layman's terms, uh, and not just coach speak, and honestly show your kid how to do it. Show your kid how to train. Show your kid the strength and conditioning program that they're gonna need. Show them the, the throwing program they're gonna need. You can't just buy a throwing program. You can't just start doing strength and conditioning. There's specific things that pitchers need to do that's gonna give them the opportunity to stay healthy. And if we don't understand this full scope of it, then we're going to end up putting our kids at risk because they got a passion for the game. They got a desire to want to do something fantastic in the game. And then we just keep throwing tools at them. We get emails all the time that they say they bought this program and this program and this program. And it drives me crazy. And I ask them, I said, OK, man, which one are you going to use? They said, we're going to use all three of them. I said, how are you going to use all three of them? 
They said, well, we're going to do this one on Monday, this one on Tuesday, and this one on Wednesday. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I said, if I came in and I hired you to do a job, and on Monday I told you to do this, and you got about halfway through it, and then Tuesday I came up and I said, guess what? No, nope, we're doing this now. And you have to start all over and go back. And then on Wednesday I said, no, well, hey, wait a second. We ain't doing that. We're going to go do this something new. How would you feel about that? So now imagine what your kids are going through. Imagine what the players are going through. When we sit here and say, hey, no, try this, no, try this, no, try this. And they think, hey, that might be the answer. And then students, they start working on it. You come out and say, no, that ain't it. See, we, call, we cause that create, we cause that confusion. We create the problem. And then we blame the player. And so that's the trap that we got to be careful of. That gap between what the symptom is and what the solution to the problem is, is what we do every day at practice. Now we choose to come in and, and learn from people that can help us get better, or we choose to go try to do it on our own, which is fine, it works for some guys. Or we choose to keep trying all these crazy things that we see out there that don't make sense to us, but somebody that we really trust or we thought was smart threw something up on YouTube and said, it's the magic pill, it's the magic wand for velocity, or it's the magic wand for getting to the big leagues. And I'm just gonna tell you guys something, it's not true. It don't work that way. And what ends up happening is we create these kids that have this false identity. They have, they have this identity that's tied to some physical capability. And a lot of these kids at 16, 17, and 18 don't have the physical capability to pitch to the expectations that we think we should. And so the reason I want to tie all this back together is because I have a lot of deep conversation with pro guys that are in AA and AAA banging on the door to the big leagues. They're this close to getting to the big leagues. And you know what happens? They move up from AA to AAA, and they think they need to do something different. And then as we see all the time with guys that crash and burn at the big league level, they get to the big leagues, and then they think they got to do something completely different than what got them to the big leagues. And see, that happens all the time. We, I call them Christmas kids. I know Coach Sean was talking about them earlier. The Christmas kids are the ones that, you know what? I'm going to Vanderbilt. I'm going to Louisville. I'm going here. I'm going here. They text it all out. They make their verbal commitment when they're a sophomore. They go through their junior year and they do all right. They still hang on to it. They don't know that that coach can take that commitment away from them. And so now they still do it. I got it. I got it. I got it. They, they survive somehow and they pitch pretty good. They show up on campus. And they get down there and they're so blown away and overwhelmed about what it takes to play at that level that they come home at Christmas. I tell parents all the time, if your kid comes home and he's got his car packed, if it's loaded up to the till with all his stuff, he ain't going back. He ain't going back. And I get at least three or four calls a year from these parents that spent probably, I don't know, $75,000, $80,000 from the time their kid was 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 13, and up to the time they went to college doing travel ball, doing training, doing lessons, do all this stuff. A kid loved it the whole time. And then they show up and their freshman year on campus, it stinks so bad, the struggle so bad, they can't make that adjustment because they don't understand what it took to get there, that they come home at Christmas. And, and we see them all the time. It's heartbreaking. But at the same time, the only way we make that change, the only way we make that adjustment is that we're willing to, to admit that we got to individually train baseball players. Each one of you is a unique individual. Each one of you has got your own physical capabilities. you got your physical limitations. You have the maxes that you can get to with your strength and conditioning. And, and that's what we want to work off of. You have the maxes of what you can get to mastering your pitches. So when you stand on that rubber and the catcher puts the sign down, you know where that pitch is going to go. And then you have the ability to strategically prepare. You have the ability to understand what it takes to get to the next level because you practice and you play the way that you've trained and developed. And that makes a huge difference. Then hyper-individualized bullpens. I'm going to show you what that looks like in a second. And then in-depth game day strategic game plan. Again, these are all options to overcome the obstacles. When we understand that the symptom is not the problem, your kid's attitude about not having a good game ain't the problem. It's the, it's the identity and what we use to try to track down what is the real problem which is usually something that is either physical, it's something that they don't understand, or it's something that they feel embarrassed or ashamed about. See, that, that's a hard conversation to have. It's hard to admit, but that's the truth about where most of these kids are at today that we talk to. So here's the strike visualization chart I see. 
This is something I want every pitcher to do. When you're standing on the rubber, when you're looking in at the catcher, I want you to be able to understand how your pitch is moved by velocity movement to a location. We've seen the dime connects, great stuff. We see the 4D motion gives us the ability to do that. When we're developing individual pitches, that's the piece that we want you to think through and start with. The next piece is we go through and we define our pitches. Every pitcher that we work with has their own unique individual pitches. So when we sit here, there's no cookie cutter pitchers. And it drives me crazy with scouts because I tell them all the time, the same don't mean equal. I can sit here and take 295 mile an hour fastballs and data will show me that those 295 mile an hour fastballs don't look the same to the hitter. So you know what, I can choose a location or I can create a strategic game plan for, for each one of those pitchers using the same data. And I still might not want that one pitcher to throw that 90 mile, 95 mile an hour fastball in this 2-2 count. But the other kid that's got it that sinks or moves and cuts, that might be the absolute best pitch for him to throw in that situation and count. See, that's the decision-making process that pitching becomes when we're physically capable, when we've mastered our pitches and we have a strategic game plan. And then the third piece is we throw strategic bullpens. That means every time that I throw a full speed bullpen that I got an intent for that pitch, that I mark it, that I know by velocity and movement to a location what that pitch is going to do. That's the only way we truly master individual pitches. And so when it comes down to how do we tie, tie all this together, how do we take the, t the data, the technology that the data provides for us, and the technology that provides the data, and how do we use that to create individual strategic game plans? This is the way we do it. It's not rocket science, but it's something that if you guys don't understand that concept of individually developing your pitches and how do we practice to improve until mastery, then we're going to just consistently keep doing and trying different things and, and we just end up frustrated. And so I want you guys to, to walk away with this, that baseball is this unique sport, man. It's, it's one of these things that we have to individually train and develop. And then we get to go play with our friends. We get to go play with our teammates and have that unique bonding experience that only baseball can provide. But it only happens if you guys really intellectually love the game and are curious about what it takes to get to the next level. So again, my name is Daryl Coulter. I run Star Pitching. This is one of my favorite quotes that, that I've read in the book, Keith Cunningham, and The Road Less Stupid. He said, nothing can change until the unsaid is spoken. See, that's what happens when we have real conversations like this today. It's not the most comfortable conversation. It's not conversations that is probably the most popular thing we'll see. But these are the conversations for the kids that have that are strategic thinkers, that have the heart and desire to want to be a next level player, that have the desire to want to go out and, and make the sacrifices that it takes to play at the next level. Then they get this. Those are the kids that we're looking for. Those are the kids that we're going to watch on TV one day and have a lot of fun doing it. So again, I thank you guys for your attention. And if you got any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Okay, stream, if you have any questions, now is the time to ask. And, uh, if you guys have any questions, Sam. This is about a minute behind, so if you have any questions, it'll take a second. No worries. <laughs> What's the problem you feel like you hear the most frequently at the big league level? Like what, you know, is the problem they most frequently run into? How do I, how do I master my pitches? These are the most physically capable guys in the world. So the conversations we have is rarely about mechanics. They throw 95, 96, 93, whatever it is. Usually they can control two or three pitches. But what happens is when we get in a real game environment, it's changes. There's no bullpen hall of fame. I tell these guys all the time, man. There's no bullpen hall of fame. There's no showcase hall of fame. It might have been a part of what it takes to get there. But at the end of the day, we're just as baseball players about what happens when we walk and cross that white line and we walk up the back of the mound. And so honestly, pitching at the next level is not about physical capability, it's about decision making. Every pitch I make is about the decision. Is this the absolute best pitch to throw in this situation and count? And when you start dissecting the game that way, and when these pitchers at the higher levels really start looking at the game that way, it changes the way they approach the way they practice. And then the way they practice becomes ingrained. And now when we start doing real strategic game planning, when we take this technology and we start breaking down 
the patterns and habits and tendencies of hitters. And we all have patterns, habits, and tendencies that once we get under stress, that we revert to. And so the best players in the world don't. And that's the unique thing about them. But that's the biggest thing I see with them is that when we see at, at that point that it's really about a decision-making process, then we get to have a lot deeper conversation. Man, that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, so it looks like it's pretty quiet on awesome. this side. So, okay. So, so then, Thank awesome, you, guys. We're going to go ahead and take a 10 minute break then. We'll be back in just a minute. If you guys want to stretch, get some water or something like that, feel free to. All right. Oh, yeah. Can we give a round of applause for Daryl, please? Thank you so much.